Um, we are all extending the warmest welcome to the second as a spotlight of 2023 on the topic of watery ecologies. For those of you joining an ASLA event for the first time, a special welcome. We are so glad that you have joined us today and invite you to help sustain and further our work by becoming an ASLA member, if you're not already part of the association. Uh, my name is Serpil Operman. I'm professor of environmental humanities at Cappadocia University, Turkey, and I am very happy to participate in today's event. Um, I'm zooming in from Ankara though, but I run the Environmental Humanities Center in Cappadocia, a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site in central Anatolia, famous for its characteristic pillar-like rock formations with um, mushroom-shaped caps, which we call here um, fairy chimneys. And they, they, they all date back about 60 million years. And Cappadocia itself literally means land of the beautiful horses. Um, people have said here since Paleolithic age. First the Hatties came, then the Hittites, the Assyrians followed, and then came the Phrygians, the Romans arrived, and finally the Turks came. Um, the area is also famous uh, because it was home uh, to the first Christian settlers' communities fleeing, the re fleeing religious persecution from um, Romans. Shizela? Thank you, Serpil. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Gisela Jefes, co-president of ASLI with uh, George Hanley. Uh, just, uh, just to inform you a little bit about ASLI uh, and this series, ASLI's uh, leadership launched this series in 2021 to elevate the work of our members in creative writing, scholarship, public engagement, and more. We're very excited to continue to foster connections with new audiences, audiences through this spotlight series. By way of logistic information, we will ask you that you remain on mute. Uh, we'll have time for questions later, and we will ask you to use the chat box to post your questions. Please try to keep the questions concise, uh, since the only so since we only have brief minutes to together right after the presentations. Uh, I'm going to also present my co-host, uh, Serpil Opperman, who is a professor of environmental humanities and the director of the Environmental Humanities Center at Cappadocia University. She has been the seventh president from 2016 to 2018 of the European Association for the Study of Literature, Culture and Environment. She's the author of Ecologies of Historic Planet in the Anthropocene, which came out in 2023, and Blue Humanities, Storied Wirescapes in the Anthropocene, which also came in 2023. Her most recent co-edited volumes are Environmental Humanities, Voices from the Anthropocene, published in 2017, and Turkish Ecocriticism, from Neolithic to Contemporary Timescapes of 2020. She's currently working on theorizing blue humanities discourses. Thank you, Serpil. Thank you, Gisela. Um, and now it's my turn to introduce you. Gisela, Gisela Hefes is a writer eco-critic and public intellectual with a particular focus on literature, media, and the environment in Latin America. Her highly reviewed books, uh, book, um, Politicas de la Destrucción, Poeticas de la Preservación, currently translated into English, examines narratives from the mid 20th century to the present that are related to uh, the environment in Latin America and analyzes how these texts refer to both the conservation and destruction of nature. In addition to her scholarly work, Gisela is an active fiction writer. In 2020, she published El Cerro Mobile de Su Boca, The Mobile uh, Zero of Its Mouth, a bilingual book of poetry and the novel Cocodrilos in La Noche. I'm sorry um, um, for, for my... Uh, accent in Spanish. I hope I got it right. Great. Okay, I think we can uh, continue. Um, I will introduce uh, the first panelists and it's, it's, it's really my pleasure, but we will alternate in introducing um, our, our speakers. Our first presenter is uh, Jeremy Chow. 
Uh, Jeremy Cho is an assistant professor of English at Bucknell University, which occupies the ancestral territories of Sasukuenok peoples. Cho's research promiscuously explores the in intersections among the environmental humanities, queer and trans studies, and theories of race and decolonization. Cho is the editor of 18th Century Environmental Humanities, 2023, and the author of The Queerness of Water that also came out in 2023, this year. Thank you for that kind introduction, Serpil and Gisela. Thank you for hosting us. And I want to express my gratitude to Amy and the rest of the ASLI team, as well as my fellow panelists um, in joining me today, especially as we move towards the end of a term and in honor of, of World AIDS Day. Um, so I'm gonna talk very briefly in, in the time that's allotted about this book project um, that I'm really pleased to say was published just a few months ago. And in my short time that I have with you, I have three primary goals. First is to describe the origins of this project, second to describe the argument of the project, and third to describe its organization. Um, so I will say that I came to this project in a, in a rather weird way. Um, and that's because when I was in graduate school, and as many of us have experienced, we are required to consume a lot of material at the same time, ultimately reframing or reconsidering disparate conversations or different fields. And so, um, while I was preparing for this, I noticed that while I was reading Rachel Carson's Silent Spring and Daniel Defoe's 1719 novel Robinson Crusoe, there was something very strange, something very queer for me happening with water. Um, for those that might be familiar with Carson's work in Silent Spring, Carson describes how um, uh, because of the enmeshment of DDT as an environmental toxin, it's impossible for it to be washed away, for example, by rain. At the same time, I noticed this type of aqueous antagonism in Defoe's novel. While much scholarship primarily focuses on Crusoe's relationship with Friday, his enslaved interlocutor, um, as well as what happens on the island despair, less attention had been paid to the series of sea storms that ultimately waylay him on the island despair. And so uh, by bringing these together and remaining and committed to queer, trans, and sexuality studies, I sought to create, foster, imagine a project that was, as um, Serpo mentioned, a form of promiscuous inquiry. For me, promiscuous inquiry, of course, is connected to thinking through its connotation in terms of sexuality, but also in honoring its etymology as a word that acknowledges um, mixing, um, sometimes coherently and sometimes not coherently, which I think might be also a tenant of this book project. And so in The Queerness of Water, what I attempt to do is demonstrate how bodies of water, whether those are sea waves, oceans, um, pools, ice sheets, lakes, or rivers, participate in reframing, reshaping, deforming, making porous notions of colonial masculinity. And this project has really centralized 18th century studies, a field that is quite small to begin with. And so as a result, in terms of thinking through my own promiscuous inquiry and my goal as a critical, as a sort of cultural critic, I wanted to expand and extend the tendrils of the conversations I was inaugurating. So for me, as someone, as I mentioned, that's invested in queer studies, I'm not interested in thinking of water as, as an element that outs, right? That is somehow inherently queer. I am instead interested in thinking through how different modes of queerness, that is, modes of being, epistemologies as they pertain to temporality, the human species, et cetera, are actually performed by literature and media. So in my desire to undiscipline these rather stalwart commitments in the academy, I have staged a series of conversations in the book that yes, feel like a traditional book project, but also have incorporated what I call intermezzi. These are short intermediary chapters that think through the larger historical waves or wake of the conversations I discuss in the traditional chapters. So for example, in my first chapter, as I mentioned, I talk about Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. In the second chapter, I jump almost 250 years to thinking about Adrian Rich's poetry collection, Diving into the Wreck. I teach diving into the wreck in my course, Literature in the Sea at Bucknell, which is perched along the Susquehanna River. 
in thinking through this intermezzo, I am interested in pedagogy, in thinking about climate change and the ways we teach, and also thinking about um, uh, settler context, especially given that I teach at a predominantly white institution that occupies the ancestral territories of the Susquehannock peoples. As a result, the different intermezzi move from poetry to comics, to graphic narrative, to film, and ultimately, in my conclusion, I attempt to demonstrate that contemporary and 18th century conversations are germane to the queerness of water. And by doing this, I merge conversations between a parody of a Jane Austen novel that is Sense and Sensibility, rebranded as Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters, and the Oscar-winning film, The Shape of Water. In this way, I hope that this project is an invitation to thinking creatively about how we can, and I know my other panelists are doing this, unsettle what our disciplines do and think through a capacious and energetic environmental humanities. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm gonna go, thank you. Uh, Circle, thank you, Jeremy. I'm going to introduce um, our second presenter, Tanya Haverland. Tanya uh, Haverland is a Trinational poet, German, South African, Mauritian, in the and is the hybrid of a Hamburg sailor and Mauritian artist born in Africa, raised in Arabia, and matured in Europe. She publishes, performs, and exhibits her poetry and multimedia collaborations across the globe. She lives in Italy and Mauritius, where she writes, teaches, sings, and creates with the water as her element of connection to this world. Her first collection, Hyphen, which came out in 2009, won the 2010 Ingrid Junker Prize. Her second collection, Water Flame, Fiamma Diakwa, was published by Mill Crew Editions in 2019. She co-edits the online, online bilingual eco-poetic Poetura column for poetry therapy, therapy Italia. The Torrid Zone, was selected for the two, uh, 2023 Berlin Zebra Poetry Film Festival and shortlisted for the 2023 Obiel Poetry Film Contest. Thank you, Tanya, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Um, could I ask you to play the video because I prefer my work to speak for me first. <laughs> It is raining below the belt. Let us turn back and smell the lush plants and trees until the sun returns still above, shining light direct into the forests of our bodies. As the bright flowers between our legs bud and bloom and grow. Aristotle classified what we know deep down inside as we open our mouths and drink in the clouds we recall. We are varied animal life. We call pleasure, we call love, we call life as we fall tropical, human humid and moist, sunshine, rain and leaves, petals, tears and cries of joy. We are wet, we are slippery, we are stale, we are secretions, creations, fluid hibiscus, we recall us, the torrid zone. Thank you. 
The Torrid Zone was born out of my return to Mauritius after quite a few years of being away. Um, and at the time also, which was last year, I was researching Karen Barad, specifically uh, meeting the universe halfway um, and eco-criticism in general. And I was really getting stuck in some of the terms and trying to understand them more viscerally. Um, at the same time, I'd attended an online conference on poetic inquiry as a new form of research. Um, so I decided to apply this by combining my physical experiencing through all the senses with my understanding intellectually of concepts and ideas. So what happened is that I tried to unpack um, terms that I was coming across that I couldn't quite understand uh, by connecting them to what I was experiencing in my life. Um, and also I live right in front of a, a bay. And so I'm in the water every day connecting to, 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 to that element. Um, and I came across Aristotle's term, uh, torrid and temperate zones. And, and I thought of how these terms are loaded with connotations and biases and innuendos and nuances um you know torrid zone torrid affair and temperate is is seen as as a virtue almost um whereas torrid is more exaggerated and over the top um and i felt how the global north imposes its labels and categories on the global south um so it can be anywhere from torrid to terrorist, these, these terms get used. And um, I think we are seeing how, uh, witnessing how the dehumanization can occur even in places like Gaza through the labeling of uh, places and people. Um, and so this video poem is an eco-feminist, eco-artivist, eco-erotic, eco-sensual recalling of what luscious living occurs in the so-called torrid zones of our Earth's bodies and waters and also our earthly and watery bodies. Um, it is the secretions, the spit, the saliva, the quim, the semen, the waters of life, ocean and bodily fluids of animals and of flowers and sap, etc., that can be spells, spelling reconnection and rising up. A recalling, which is... Um, also a remembering, but also renaming. Um, the water is the erotic life connection between the continents for me. So it's also a way of connecting the global and the, and the global south and the global north. Uh, just like the vowels connect between the consonants, like Anne Carson explores in Eros the Bittersweet and David Abrams in The Spell of the Sensuous. So there, there's a lot of play on, 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 on the vowel sounds as well within that. Um, and then there's the mystical, magical, collaborative work uh, that I have with my colleague, Karin Iriart, which is probably because she also comes from an island uh, in France called Oléron. Um, and so she understands the rhythms of these watery spelt words uh, and puts them into musical sounds and images. Um, and so for me, it's like speaking about possibly political elements uh, I, in the poetry that, that, that I write and that I speak and that I sing, I try to combine those uh, things that, that I'm thinking about, but also with a more um, feeling connecting through through the body. So 
um, Jacques Cotier, this, this, this fellow South African poet, say, I said, I seduce people into, into my activism. <laughs> and I said, okay, uh, maybe that's one way of saying it, but, but I think it's more about um, choosing joy and not just pain. Uh, uh, and, and that brings more hope for myself and hopefully also for, for other people who, who experience the work. Um, and I just want to leave with <clears throat> a quote from Diane de Prima's rant, uh, where she says, the only war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed, are subsumed in it. And um, I find that, that that through the imagination, we can, we can interact with, with, with our planet and with our people in a, in a, in a different way. And, and perhaps that's what's lacking often. So, uh, yeah, so, so my work is kind of trying to, to, to rediscover that in, in, in whichever way I, I connect to my everyday life, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation is going to be by Kim Trainer. Kim uh, Trainer is a poet and filmmaker. Her latest book of poetry, A Blueprint for Survival, uh, which came out with Guernica Editions, will appear in spring 2024. Um, I, I'm joining you from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh so Tooth Nations. Um, thank you so much for um, including me in this um, presentation. Uh, Hulitsum Signs is a film that is part of a guided um, walk that was organized by myself and Amy Claire Hustis, who is a, an artist uh, at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. It's a guided walk of a key biodiversity area along the Pacific Flyway uh, at the mouth of the Fraser River, which is a very rich estuary, um, in particular for its biofilm, which feeds Dunlin and Western sandpipers and other shorebirds on their migratory flight north uh, for their breeding grounds in Alaska and the Arctic. Uh, and it's at, at, at the moment it's at risk because of a, a second port, which is a terminal, which is going to be installed very close to the site. Um, so that was part of our impetus for creating this guided walk, which was um, curated by the Hulitsum First Nation. This is their ancestral territory, as well as Hulkamin and language speakers, scientists, and artists. It's it's almost six minutes or a bit more, so I'm quite happy if you need to pot it down um, at some point, and I can put the link in the chat. Thanks. The Dunlin returned in early December and spoke to me in signs. Algorithms of blue, murmurations, fingerprints, wing tips canted in flight, blue peels and hieroglyphs, fleet. Theirs is an emergent property governed by separation, alignment, extension, and fear. There's a formula for complexity, and there are words in Hokminam. Mokstan i atana tamoch o slich kachtol. Everything on the earth is interconnected. The Fraser's silted tongue thickens with blooms of phytoplankton as it enters the Salish Sea. Milky blue-green, sweet and salt, sunlight and glass, sea arrow grass, tawny cotton grass, tuli and common cattail, stakun, sachwal, grasses whispering, chechokum, teitulum, grass is singing. We returned in late spring, in the month of ripening, and took a boat through Porlier Pass to Lamalchi Bay on Penelicate to see where the gunboats had fired on Lamalchi, driving them east through Active Pass to Hritsum, where they became the swish of cutting reeds. 
At the charred pilings of the Brunswick cannery, Lindsay idled the boat, said, we're close, close, close to this place, coming every night in summer to catch Chinook, tides high on summer nights. Later, Bill would tell us there was oral history of Canoe Pass, that newcomers had to sing the song of Hlitsum to be granted passage. There's the blue net shed that used to be green, dark pilings like a serpent's ravaged teeth. The last place we could speak our own language was right here, Canoe Pass, out on the water at night where no one could hear. Swallows feeding on the wing. Quack satsun. We have changed the course of the river, its mouth skewered with dikes and terminal causeways. The fish can't get through. The resident orcas are thin to extinction. The runs of Chinook and Sakai are low. There's no sturgeon anymore. River rises from the green mud and spits a bloom of tiny creatures. Glass-walled diatoms, wandering phytoplankton that ride the cold salt water, balance of sweet and salt. Diatoms spin sunlight into threads of polysaturated fatty acids, a woven mat of biofilm as sandpipers touch down and feed with keratinous, bristled tongues, gathering energy for their long flight north to breeding grounds on the Copper River Delta in Alaska. Salmon smolts hide in the plume, a refuge from predators, adjust to salinity and temperature, and again on their return. Tiny plankton to cowpot to sculpin, crustacean, loon, grebe, blue heron. You see, everything is connected. Moksten i atana tomoch o slich pakto. We always come back to this place. Those last images were actually taken by a drone by um, a, a, a scientist, a biologist at UBC, a grad student who flies his giant drone out over the estuary, over the mudflats and takes um, images so he can measure the biofilm. Um, because partly the mix of fault, fault, fresh water and salt water is what allows the biofilm to be created, and the second terminal will probably devastate that creation. Um, but anyways, I'll put the link in, in the chat. Oh, it's already in the chat. Um, so, well, actually it's not, but I'll add it. And, and also the link to the Walk Quietly project, but um, thank you. Okay. Sofia Barina is a Berlin-based writer and researcher, co-author of Aquatopia, Climate Interventions, and co-editor um, of special issue, um, Somotechnics on Data Matters. Their work has appeared or is forthcoming in Catalyst, Shima, European Journal of Women's Studies, and Women's Studies Quarterly, among others. And their co-author, May Joseph, who is unable to join us today, is the founder of Harmattan Theater, an environmental theater company based in New York City, and professor of global studies in the Department of Social Science and Cultural Studies at Pratt Institute, New York. She's currently the managing co-editor-in-chief of Island Studies Journal. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for having Aquatopia as an Asla uh, spotlight. Uh, May would love to be here today, but unfortunately, she won't be able to join us. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Aquatopia, which just came out this year with Rutledge, and then I will show an excerpt 
from the video Aquatopia, which documents um, performance uh, directed by May Joseph and performed by Harmattan Theatre in 2017 at Governor's Island. So in Aquatopia, what May and I try to do is to offer a critical overview of the work that we have been developing with Harmattan Theatre over the years. So I joined the company in 2010 and May had founded the company in 2009. And we've been creating environmental performances uh, around the world that highlight issues of climate change and um, environmental precarity. So in Aquatopia, we um, focus on specific performances that we have um, done. We have five interludes um, in which we show um, how each um, performance uh, grapples with issues of climate change in specific uh, sites. So we selected um, these five performances um, in, in New York, Venice, uh, Amsterdam, and Lisbon. And here you can see an image um, from, uh, from Aquatopia. So what Harmattan Theater um, does is to work with water as a liminal substance. Uh, we are interested in non-human collaborations and we think of our work with uh, different sites as really a multi-species, interspecies praxis. We are especially interested in sites that are waterbound and are uh, especially vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Um, so we work with oceans, seas, rivers, lagoons, lakes, ports, piers. Here uh, we have an image from uh, Dreamscapes, which was performed in 2010 at the Chelsea Piers in New York. And it was the first performance that I um, that I did with Harmattan Theater. We work with um, different um, cities uh, around the world and we are really interested in the human and non-human communities that we find in the sites that we focus on and we are really interested in looking at the violent colonial histories of these cities of these sites that we work with and how they intersect with today's environmental precarity so we are thinking about the the current present uh, in terms of a, um, a history of the present here we have um, uh, the poster for Aquatopia, uh, which was a large scale participatory performance project, which um, included um, 100 performers. And uh, of, of those 100 performers, 20 were members of Harmattan Theater and the other ones were spectators. So they were um, people from the audience that integrated the choreography, the performance that we put together. So I'm going to show an excerpt from the video documentation of Aquatopia. I hope you'll enjoy it. You're all welcome to join us when we are carrying the, carrying the river, the Hudson River. This is the Hudson River. You're welcome to join us to help us. It's a very big piece of cloth. So when we do that, we would love it if you join us to carry the Hudson River to the top.
So that's an excerpt from Aquatopia, which you can find on online on um, on YouTube. And I uh, thank you for your attention. First of all, thank all our presenters. Um, you have all enabled um, a collaborative thinking here. Um, they were fantastic. Thank you again. Um, I had the pleasure of reading some parts of your work, which clearly showcase how to aesthetically and poetically attune to waterscapes and their myriad life forms. Um, you have created living texts and they are enactments of uh, what Anna Singh once called arts of noticing. And uh, they do so through uh, performative models. Um, performance is a necessary condition for its being apprehended and experienced by the viewer and the reader. Uh, you all took it a step further, making it a condition for participatory experience through a multi-species practice. So my question is whether, uh, whether or not you think this practice can further be enhanced by including non-human communication systems, their semiotic relations, so to speak, so that by cultivating such relations in which, as uh, Donna Haraway would say, all partners can find a new ground for me making meanings together. I'm here imag imagining a performative space in which human and non-human voices interact, speaking within to and with one another. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can speak to, to my film. You couldn't you couldn't hear uh really the there's a there's a soundscape that accompanies the words. Um and I have a, a composer collaborator who works on it, Hazel Fairbairn. And we started by building up the, the soundscape by doing field recordings of uh shorebirds and all other insects and also um bioelectric um, impulses that were fed through a MIDI board and triggered various sounds that had been recorded. So we were trying to incorporate the sounds of that site of Brun Brunswick Point to allow them to speak, um, you know, speak through the film. Um, and I, I would say a lot of my work is going in that direction. Um, more recently, working with old growth speckle belly lichen, uh, thinking about um, some of the current research that's being done. Um, I read a paper the other day on uh, using AI machine learning to interpret the electrical spike activities of fungi um, and map them onto human languages to see if there's actually, and now this is anthropocentric in that it's thinking about what a language is, right? But that it has semantics, it has grammar, syntax, it's not just inherent vocalization, but it's learned. Um, so there's some really interesting work being done in the sciences. So partly what my work does is try to uh, take a lot of that current scientific research and then translate it into maybe what some of some of the other um, presenters here have spoken about, more sort of sensual qualities and joyous qualities of of language and artistic practice. That's my short answer to your to your awesome question. Yeah, thank you. By language, I of course do not mean human communicative systems. Um, yeah, Gisela. I, oh, oh sorry, but I'll just to follow up on that circle. I would say that it is interesting though to because if we're recording this idea of sentience and and language as we would think of it in the human context, um, it has some interesting um, possibilities simply in terms of legal implications, like offering a sort of personhood, so to speak, to these other species. Um, Regardless of, yeah, and yes, absolutely, of course, that there are other kinds of languages that we're using it in a metaphorical sense. Yeah, they use sound and colors and signals. Chemical signaling, for example, happens deep within the ocean among species. Yeah, yeah I was I was thinking a lot um, of your question in, in terms of sound as well. Um, because one way in which the, the non-human really participates in our projects is precisely through sound. And if we have been able to hear the sound from the video, you can, you, you'll notice how the flute is playing at the same time that we hear the wind. Uh, and that's sort of a motif in, in our video. So you hear the, the elements, you'll hear 
the river, you hear the sea. So if we want to think of that as a, a kind of non-human language, uh, that's one way that we can perceive that language, right? As humans, um, we perceive it through through sound. Uh, and that's a, a really important element in, in our performance work. Um, so that's what I was thinking about. But also, like you said, in terms of color and you know the way that our senses are stimulated uh, by non-human elements um, and how this comes to constitute a, a, an artistic project um, that's what what I'm thinking about in terms of the of the non-human participating in our in our projects as well your jellyfish um, are actually uh, they're communicating through colors Um, I, just a few days ago, actually, I was, um, at a horse therapy center and, um, in Cape Town with, with a person called Adele Pudney, and she doesn't believe in using horse therapy as in like, um, uh, telling, going and doing specific things with the horses, but basically what you do is you just sit in the field with them and allow them to, to do what they're doing. Um, so, so it's very much just like sitting and, and being there and just, and being careful. And, and what came to me in that field, as I, as I just felt the horses as well as seeing them, because I mean, and smelt them. And I mean, it's, it's a very sensual experience, but, and you're sitting down on the ground and they're big and they're walking. But then I started realizing how they were moving in a sort of choreography, um, and so I started thinking about how, and I haven't quite figured it out yet, but how animals also create art. It's not, it's not just about language. And, and they were actually creating, uh, I, I don't know if it's even a, if, if it's a dance, but they were creating something um, where they came, the two, there were three, but there were two that came around like this, and then afterwards walked straight out the two of them. So it was really a choreography. And and I really felt that I um, I didn't want to interpret what they were saying, because uh, that would be too anthropocentric, but I really felt that they were performing um, something in, in, in that moment. And it was really, really um, moving, yeah. Yeah, well, um, in what seems like patterns of intelligibility there, right? I mean, that was an intelligent, intelligent choreography. Mm. And beautiful. Mm. Maybe, uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you want to kind of follow up on uh, that question. I have lots of responses to it, but I know, Gisela, that you also have a question for us, so um, maybe it might be better for us to continue to think through other ideas and, and give time to audience members as well. Sure, thank you. And uh, I just, uh, as a reminder uh, to the audience, if you have any question, just please go ahead and uh, place it in the chat box. So my, my question is a little bit uh, in a different direction, and uh, uh, what I notice is that uh, all of you have engaged uh, in thoughtful and meaningful ways to capture the water flows in different settings and different landscapes and both its presence and participatory role in individual and community war making. So I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about your different methodologies to build up this hydric archive of hope and despair. I'll start this question. I think we all have very different and diverse methods, which I think has made this conversation really rich. I will say that I've often, as someone that works in primarily literary study, I've often thought about what actually my method is, right? When you just stick a book in front of your face and sort of mine through it in some ways. Um, and so I think this is different than, you know, Sophia, Kim, and Tanya's work where you're sort of listening to and with your archives in ways that feel um, less exploitative than potentially sort of like mining through a text to look for meaning in some ways. 
And so I'm reminded of, and I think this was also to, to Tanya's presentation, but Teresa Shuri has this um, project called uh, Hope at Sea and is thinking through an archipelagic archive that is also literary and medial in scope, um, but in conversation with Ernest Bloch is, is interested in both the, the sort of very positive dimensions of hope, but also the potentially political associations with hope and the way in which it sometimes eclipses different um, organizations or coalitionisms, et cetera, et cetera. And so I will say in thinking through the, the larger scope of my own work right now, I am of course indebted to thinking through literary and media archives, but I think this is what I try to do with the Intermezzi, which is really expand what we consider as an archive, both lowercase a and capital letter A. Um, and I think that interests me right now. I could say uh, I I love the idea I love I love archives and I love the idea of archives, um, and a lot of my work like my next book coming out is thinking about archives like, uh, seed data banks for example like the Svalbard data bank but um, like community seed banks as well, uh, in rural communities um, and then, with this project that I I was working on. Uh, it's a kind of archive as well where we were thinking what are the what are the some of the original words that the Hokuminum used uh, the Hokuminum language speakers used to describe you know the and interact with the birds and the flora and fauna of the place um how are scientists interacting with this space uh how are uh, how are artists interacting with it as well and sort of trying to give us create a space for all of these voices to come together in a kind of dialogue. Um, and we were speaking with my, my co-curator and I, Amy, were speaking with um, one of the larger bird organizations and uh, Wishern, and they were, they were interested in our, our project in the sense that there are so many, um, so many terrible news stories that come out all the time about shorebirds decline, um, decline of all species, in fact, um, but bringing community together and telling these stories and presenting them um, can be a form of hope as well to show that there, there, there are networks of individuals who are concerned and working towards making changes and advocating on behalf of more than human kin. So I think that would, that would be my answer in brief to your, your question. Um, I I would say that my my approach um, in the work that I developed with May and with Harmattan Theater is primarily historical. So we are, are looking at sites that are uh, precarious and exposed to climate change, but we are also looking at colonial histories and the ways in which um, cities like um, New York or Amsterdam or Lisbon or Venice um, have a, a particular repository of colonial histories that um, you can look at through uh, water archives and through the, the presence of water in these sites. Um, so the work that we do is really um, looking at genealogies of water and how those geneal genealogies are going to recite colonial histories and how to think about climate change um, and climate vulnerability um, through these very convoluted histories that bring together disparate sites. Um, and we, we use uh, these histories to conceive uh, of our projects. And so that's really always how we begin a project is really looking at the, the history of the site and uh, the history of its uh, exposure to climate change. Um, and particularly in, in, in New York, um, and in Venice, which is uh, sinking, the, the projects we've we've done there um, are really looking at the past very much uh, alongside with the with the present. Uh, uh, Tanya, I'm not sure if you want to just finish with. With a, a reflection on the question, or uh, just because we have very few minutes left, 
Sure. Um, well, you, my methodology is, like I say, very experiential, you know, actually listening and but but list by listening i mean through all the senses not just with the ears um also participatory uh i was um asked to do a piece for ansbach uh, boulevard in in brussels and i found out that that whole boulevard in the metro uh had been a river and so i got uh people from the area to because it was a project called the technology of tenderness so Combining the story of that river turning into Metro, I also asked people what tenderness is for them and then created a collage poem, which became a soundscape and video. So for me, the work is very much about participating through listening and not to, to the non-human world, but also to the humans who live within that space and, and trying to, to collaborate in that way, yeah. Well, I think we are 159, which is the perfect timing to wrap up. I, I just want to say on behalf of Ashley, uh, we thank you all for participating today in the series. It has been delightful. Uh, we apologize uh, for the issues with the with technology. I want to say thank you uh, to Circle for co-hosting the event. And of course, Amy uh, for uh, coordinating the series. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the Ashley members that helped going over the proposals and bring them into the uh, into dialogue for this series. This is uh, Lucian Meadows and Kate Hover and co-president George Hanley. Please stay in tune uh, for the next two coming series in the spring. We're looking forward uh, to sharing those with you. And thank you all again for uh, for being here. It has been delightful and we're looking forward to hearing more about your wonderful projects. <laughs>